I deserve that applause because I was one of the people at 2 a.m. who was wandering around outside the Marriott Hotel for an hour waiting to figure out what was happening. So please forgive me if I'm a little punchy uh, after lunch. And I'll forgive you if you fall asleep because you know, I know we're all running on fumes. Um, but I do appreciate this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and it's great to see so many old friends here. So thank you for inviting me uh, to present today. And I'm hoping to talk about a, a slightly different angle of this uh, issue, which we're here to discuss, which is about collective action, and um, in particular, scholarly publishing and journal publishing, and kind of some of the things that are happening there that we need to be paying attention to, and uh, hopefully collectively acting on. So with that, I will just, you know, in the obligatory way, say that um, I also was very inspired by Dan Hazen, and I uh, worked with him for many years here. And uh, a lot of the things that we've been talking about, I think, are they're not solved problems, but we've made a lot of progress on them over years, like collection building, you know, CRL is here, and these are things that we do understand pretty well. Another thing that Dan uh, talked about was our collective advocacy, and this is uh, the obligatory quote from him, that libraries must actively engage in reformulating information flows and scholarly communication in order to protect future research and learning. He went on, however, to note that we're not very good at that. Um, we do it very well in uh, focused efforts at small scale, um, and then it gets harder as, as the problem gets bigger and the community gets more diverse around it. So he talks about how universities and libraries must devise models for governance that ensure local accountability and cooperative activities, which is really what we're here to talk about today. So I want to talk about a particularly interesting shift that's going on in scholarly journal publishing and uh, pose to you the question that we really may need to think differently about collective action in this context. So what we have, I'm gonna be talking about a project that, that um, we did at the University of California with some other partners, who, many of whom are represented here. Uh, and what motivated that project was this observation that the way North America and Europe and much of the rest of the world are approaching open access to the journal literature is pretty different. I mean, in particular, North America has focused so far on open access of the green variety, where we have institutional repositories like Dash. And um, in Europe, it's been more focused on article processing charges and open access in the, in the journals themselves. Um, and we observed that that has potential to be bad for the library and academic community since scholarly publishing is a global activity, and we really can't afford to do both of these things at the same time. So we decided to pose this hypothetical question. Well, what if, you all know what Open Access 2020 is? It's a proposal from Europe that we should just flip the entire journal, uh, scholarly journal publishing system to the article processing charge <laughs> model so that everything is open access and everything is paid through fees, no more licenses. Okay, so that's, that's been seriously proposed. And uh, so we did this project to look at the consequences of that for North American research universities and libraries. And part of what I'll do is uh, present the findings of that and then we can talk about the implications of that. So keep in mind that this is a model of a world where everything is paid for by APCs, no more subscriptions. And it's from the perspective of North American research universities like the ones represented here. So uh, we started with some quantitative research. We have a lot of data. We got data from all of the library partners, and I will just briefly call them out. Uh, we did work with Harvard, also Ohio State, so Carla is here, um, University of British Columbia, and Joanne is here, who was there at the time, and then, of course, the UC system. Um, so what we did was collect journal expenditure data over a five-year period from these institutions, and then we looked at uh, publications by authors who are at those institutions, and also research expenditures as, as much as we could gather of that data. So how many grants are coming into these universities that might be applied to, to this type of expense? And then we looked at article processing charges and the cost of publishing pretty broadly. Um, so a few of the questions that we posed and tried to answer were, what does it actually cost to publish an article? And uh, so if you look at article processing charges, there's a wide range. And actually, the lowest number is zero. There are plenty of uh, scholarly journals today that don't charge any fees at all. This is the platinum publishing model. But, but typically, they're in the range of five to $4,000. That's a pretty big range. Um, so we did a lot of uh, evaluation of that and looked at what uh, publishers actually 
spend um, to run their businesses and came up with a couple of numbers, a sort of plausible minimum and then a defensible amount that includes a small profit for them. Uh, and that's a little under $2,000 per article. But we decided that that was a really stupid question to ask. <laughs> Because the truth is that uh, what counts as publishing varies across every publisher, sometimes across every journal. Um, it depends so much on the publisher's uh, economies of scale, how many journals they have. And most importantly, there are all these fixed effects that publishers have, like, you know, are they based in downtown London, where the rents are rather high? You know, so uh, it turns out that, that you can't really answer this question because there are so many variables to it. So we moved on. What will APCs cost in the future? And we observed that there are really two flavors of publishers in this game now, the ones who don't charge anything because they're publicly subsidized in some way, like eLife, and the ones who um, are you know, converting typically from a license model to this new model um, and are trying to figure out what they can charge for their journals. Um, and we noticed that there's a very strong, not surprisingly, a strong positive correlation between the so-called quality of the journal, i.e something like its impact factor, and what the APCs are, are uh, for those journals. So publishers are noticing this um, connection between what they can charge and what the perceived value of that journal is. So we came up with, we did a ton of regression analysis and came up with a formula to estimate what a publisher will charge as their APC for any given journal based on its um, source normalized impact number. The, basically, it's like a discipline sensitive impact factor. So, um, and you know, you can argue with this. This is not uh, science, really. <laughs> it's, um, it's just looking at the data we have available and making a guess at how publishers are gonna determine prices in the future. So what we figured out is that a baseline journal like PLOS One will charge approximately $1,856 per article, and guess what? That's pretty much exactly what they charge. So um, based on that, formula, we can now ask the question, well, what will it cost you to pay for every article that your authors have published in a given year, okay? So that's what we did, and we looked at budgets of libraries. So here's an example from my institution. My journal budget is approximately $4 million. Uh, my authors in the sample year published almost, um, well, a little over 3,500 papers, um, the majority of which were associated with grants, but quite a few were not. And if I estimate what the APCs would have been for those articles and what those add up to, it's quite a bit more than my library budget. It's 7.5 million as opposed to four. Okay, and if you look though at those fees that would not have been covered by grant funds, okay, then the number is considerably lower. It's 2.2, which is half my current budget. So, that shows you right there that there's this big question mark about whether in this new world it would all come from the library budget or would it come from a variety of sources including grant funds, which is how authors are paying these fees today, typically. Okay, so what we can see is that clearly in this new world there would be huge winners and losers in the financial sense. The losers are down there in the red and they're institutions like Harvard and Yale and Cornell and mine where uh, we're very research in intensive. So we publish a lot, and we pay about the same as most other research libraries in the country. So if you just look at the library <laughs> budget, then it, this is not you know, a good scenario for us, uh, financially speaking. However, many, many institutions make out like bandits, the ones who uh, publish relatively little compared to what they're spending today on uh, licenses. So the other thing to keep in mind is that if you're only looking at the library budget, you know, almost all of the partner libraries that we looked at would, would not do well in this new world financially. But if you add the grant funds, we all do fine. Everybody comes out at about the same, Harvard is about the same budgetarily, um, but other institutions like the UC system come out quite a bit better, assuming that grants can be applied to these APCs. So we conclude from that part of the research that you know, it's very difficult to estimate what these article processing charges will be in the future. We know that publishers, especially commercial publishers, will charge as much as they can. That's kind of a given. Um, that there will be huge disciplinary differences, but they're very hard to estimate today. 
And uh, some data and some estimations are better than none. So it's, it's a crude estimation, but at least it gives us something to start with. And we also observed that in North America, library journal budgets are not gonna be enough to cover the APCs in this model if we switched tomorrow. But that if you fold in the grant funds that are available to pay those fees, all of a sudden the picture looks plausible. Um, but we have this shared concern that in this new model, article processing charges would just inflate uncontrollably like subscriptions have, right? So that's, that's a concern. So the question is, would, would this model be sustainable? And I like to show this quote from Tim Gowers, the Fields Medalist in the UK, who, a mathematician who's been thinking a lot about this new model of scholarly publishing. And he made two interesting contradictory observations. One is that APCs are just fine as long as authors don't have to pay the money themselves. Okay? Blah, blah, blah. I have never seen a convincing explanation for how a properly free market in APCs could work. Okay, and if you connect those up, it's, uh, we worked with some economists in this project who said, well, the way to solve B is A. You have to get authors back involved in the, in the process. We need them at the table. So we did some qualitative research. We interviewed and surveyed approximately 2,000 faculty at our respective institutions at all career stages and in every discipline. So it's a pretty large N. And uh, one of the things we asked them is, well, what do you really care about when you're thinking about where you want to publish your article? And of course, the answer was the quality and reputation of the journal. Distant last, <laughs> is it open access? You know, there are always going to be some authors who are really, really passionate about open access, for whom that is number one. But of the 2,000 we surveyed, the data was pretty clear. So um, what this tells us is that people are not going to change journals Okay, they, they have their favorite journals. It's gonna take a lot to get them to give up those journals and switch to something else. So we kind of have to work with the system that we have now, at least for the moment. Okay. Um, we also looked at some, something we call the willingness to pay factor. In other words, if you ask an author, what are you gonna do if it's my money versus your money? And the answer was kind of as you would expect. You know, if it's not their money, they'll pay quite a bit. If it's their money, all of a sudden, not so much, right? Because this is money that they could be using for lots of other things. So, so um, the specific amounts that they mentioned, don't pay attention to that, because they, of course, have no idea what the stuff actually costs. The point is that there were relative differences between how much they would spend if it was their pocket, their grant, their department, their institution, their library, okay? So they are sensitive to that. Um, so the economist in our team said, okay, well, I'm a market economist. I'm gonna assert that if authors had to make this decision themselves, they would suddenly start acting like shoppers and actually drive costs down. And I know that's a controversial statement because of course there are these things like tenure that you uh, kind of force you in a particular direction and those are quite real. But, um, but the point is that until we can get authors more involved in this calculation, nothing's going to change. So it's, um, it's sort of a necessary step in the process, given that there are these things that they have to deal with um, that are not price insensitive, or are price insensitive. So what would it cost institutions if we gave authors money? Okay, what if we gave them the money to do this? Um, so here's an example where we take my budget and uh, I pay all of the money that I pay today and grants cover another chunk of the articles, but there's a delta. There are authors who don't have grants and who would need new money. And what would that cost my institution? A million dollars, which is actually not that much if you look at the fact that we have 4,000 faculty. So um, another scenario is the library pays a little bit more than we do today. So my budget goes up slightly, 2.4 million more, or 2.2 million more. Grants cover less, because now I've covered more of those articles. And what's left is 0.3 million um, discretionary funds. So the total cost of the institution went up because they had to give me more money. But the amount that's going to authors is considerably less. It's a third of a million. So in other words, you can kind of see how this is a, a set of dials that you can change. You can dial up the library budget or down. You can give authors more money or less money. 
Um, but we could start to see how this works in practice. And the amount of money we're talking about is not that horrifying. So, um, so this is the prediction coming out of this project. If you give authors discretionary research funds to introduce price competition into the scholarly publishing market without interfering with choice, we have a chance of actually influencing the overall cost of the scholarly communication system and incentivize authors to try new things, which they're very reluctant to do right now. And so, you know, this, this is the prediction that we're making now. There are a million concerns. You know, every time I give a talk about this project, people bring up these concerns which are very legitimate. You know, the rich are going to get richer. Institutions that can afford to pay these fees will do so. Plenty of institutions don't have the money to pay them, um, or that's the assertion. Uh, there are lots of disciplines that don't have grant funds. What about them? What about uh, the independent scholar who's not affiliated with the university? Where are they going to get the money? What about people in the global south uh, whose library budgets are tiny? You know, so there are lots and lots of gotchas, potentially. Um, and you know, I think we do need to deal with all of those concerns and think them through. On the other hand, what if we did want to try it? Right? It's easy to say, well, there are some problems with this model, so let's just give up. Right? What if we wanted to try it? So this is where the collective action problem comes in. Okay, and there's this huge energy activation barrier when it comes to something like this. Because to be successful at what the Max Planck Society is proposing, every publisher, every funder, every library, every university, every society, and every author and every discipline would have to do this all at once, right? So we laugh because of course that is ridiculous. That makes universal healthcare look simple. So um, that's not gonna happen. And there's a lot of infrastructure that we're missing, like how to do the payments for these article processing charges to publishers. And I've, I've been chatting with colleagues from the UK who've been doing this for a while, and they'll admit that you know, the infrastructure is starting to exist, but it's pretty uh, basic, and it's um, adding on to what they already do, so it's, it's a big problem. And also, here in North America, you know, we don't like government mandates. So um, this is not going to be something that we can just tell everybody they have to do. And so that introduces this problem that, you know, we here in this room are all good friends and we all want to do the right thing together. But the truth is, we're not. We have institutions that compete heavily for rankings, for money, for donors, for it, you name it. And the libraries are part of these institutions, too. So we're always trying to figure out where we can collaborate to mutual benefit and where we can be distinctive to compete. I hope nobody disagrees that that's just the reality we're in. And so, you know, the, the truth is that we need to get better at what I call or what the world calls coopetition. And industry does this all the time, right? Where you figure out places where there's really no competitive advantage to being different so we can work together to solve the problem and all claim credit. And you know, shared collections are a really good example of that. Um, so the question then is, you know, for something like OA 2020 or some version of that to happen, is it completely hopeless? Is there any chance that we could kind of figure out a way to coopetate in that scenario instead of just anybody saying, no, I don't like it, not doing it, forget it, you know? And so, what I wanted to say is that it's really not about us, right? Uh, you know, in this kind of scenario, collective action is not going to come from the library community. It's going to come from the authors and the author societies and the publishers. And we're going to be part of that conversation, I hope. But, you know, APCs are happening. Journals are switching to this model. And they're convincing more and more authors to do this. And, you know, we can either be part of that conversation or we can say, well, we don't like that model and just go off and do our own thing. So I think that we need to look for friends. And, and I'm not pushing OA 2020 in particular. I'm just saying, who should we be cooperating with in this endeavor? And it's probably disciplines, right? I, I would say we need to be talking to societies who represent disciplines that are interested in changing the status quo and who share our concerns and um, you know, meet some of these criteria, small enough so that they could experiment with some new models, friendly to open access, have enough grant funding available so that the model actually might work financially, and so on. 
And I want to finish with a little history lesson because I find this so interesting. Um, if you read the history of science, uh, there, there's a lot of research on kind of the history of how scholarly publishing has been paid for, and high energy physics is a really interesting example because this is a field that exploded after World War I. You know, physics just took off. And so there was so much more publishing going on back then that they, they outstripped the ability for subscriptions to pay for it. So they decided to introduce page charges. And that was a very controversial idea at the beginning, that authors should pay. So um, they made this big case that articles are actually part of the public good, They're, they are a public good, and that it's in the interest of the so-called research patron, which is either a university or a funder, to, to make that public good available to the public. So we need page charges. And of course, authors were like, well, where's that coming from? So foundations stepped up and said, we'll pay the page charges to legitimatize this assertion that page charges are actually OK. And they came up with this model where if, if the cost is on the infrastructure side, things like peer review and copy editing, then the author would pay for that. If it was on the distribution side, then readers would pay for that. And by 1960, these journals in higher energy physics were getting most of their money from page fees and less than half from subscriptions. Then some things changed. The tax code changed and um, the postal code. And all of a sudden, it kind of flipped back the other way. And they, they changed the rhetoric and changed that narrative that it's a public good. And uh, all of a sudden, you see licenses and, or subscriptions uh, creeping back up and beginning to take over the dominant share of the revenue for the publishers. And that went on for another 20 or 30 years. And then along came the internet. And all of a sudden, distribution costs dropped to zero. So it, it doesn't make as much sense to charge the reader now, because it doesn't actually cost the publishers much to reach the reader anymore. Their costs are on the infrastructure side now. So I think my, my message in telling you this story is that this, this debate that we're having right now is not new. We've been going around in circles on this issue, at least in some disciplines, for many, many decades. And that it is a valid kind of trade-off between this public good argument and the value to readers in getting access to this stuff. And this is just one example. But I think if you look at this, then you do say, well, OK, yes, it is possible. It is possible for us to shift to a different model of publishing and, and paying for that, because we've done it before. So uh, I think I'm going to end there. And um, I realize that this is, you know, it's a big topic. And we do have uh, a lot of issues with cooperation and coopetition. But I would really welcome your ideas about how we can get beyond that. Thank you. Peter. Oh, I'll go sit down. Thanks, Mackenzie. And <clears throat> let me start by saying we participated in the research project you described. Uh, the project asked a lot of good questions and drew a lot of good conclusions. And Mackenzie highlighted the best of the questions and the best of the conclusions today. So I'm not going to be critical. I'm just going to ask some more questions. <clears throat> the OA 2020 project asks what would happen if every journal in the world flipped to open access and if every one of them charged an APC. Uh, and what would happen if universities were the only ones to pay those fees? And then what would happen if universities were joined by funding agencies in paying those fees? It's a good question, even though it's not going to happen. Uh, Mackenzie's analogy was to universal health care, uh, the complexities of that. My analogy is this. What if somebody had a very good argument that we would have world peace if only all of us followed the same religion? Would we <laughs> therefore all follow the same religion? No, it's not going to happen, no matter how good the argument is about the consequences. So the OA 2020 model just won't happen. There's no point talking about how to get to there from here. But the good questions that she asked afterwards were, well, how can we get close to that? Or what partial steps can we take toward that? Or what incentives will move us roughly in that direction? Those are still good questions. We don't have good answers to them. Uh, let me uh, introduce a distinction at the beginning. Uh, the project focused on fee-based open access journals, journals that charge article processing charges. Uh, today, roughly 30% of peer-reviewed open access journals charge fees. It's a minority model. 70% of peer-reviewed open access journals charge no fees at all. One thing we should ask is how to support those. We can't support them by finding money to pay the fees because they don't charge fees. 
it's, nobody's found a good solution for how to support those except to subsidize them one at a time. Your institution might publish some. Uh, the museum or the hospital or the funding agency or the government agency might, uh, down the street might fund some. But we can't simply raise money to support them uh, except through APCs. If we adopt a model like OA 2020 uh, that simply raises money for APCs, then we create the perverse incentive of asking these no-fee journals to start charging fees when in fact it would be better if some fraction of them, whether it's majority or minority, continued to charge no fees. Uh, among other things, uh, it makes those journals accessible as authors to uh, people in the global south. It also prevents a publishing monoculture, uh, which I'd like to prevent. I'd like to scale up on open access, but I want to do it in many different ways to preserve the robustness of the ecosystem. Again, we don't have a solution, but we should ask how to support those and how to prevent them from seeing good reasons to convert to fee base. Uh, Mackenzie talked about page charges as the uh, predecessor of APCs. That's true. Uh, a study about 10 years ago showed that more journals uh, charged page charges at that time than open access journals charged APCs. Uh, again, the same study that showed 30% of open access journals charged nothing showed that 70% of subscription journals charged author side fees. So when people think about charging authors, uh, they come to the conclusion that open access uh, might create barriers on the author side, when in fact it's completely flipped. It was subscription journals creating barriers on the author side, and open access journals on the whole uh, were removing them. But they have evolved into APCs. Uh, APCs are, are an efficient model for funding open access in the sense that when you have the money, you can just pay for them article by article. There's another distinction we should bear in mind. There are journals that make all their articles open, provided somebody will pay. There are others that are called hybrid journals that simply make some of them open and others not. And those charge subscriptions to libraries. That's the only way to get access to the non-open articles in the collection. We have to ask if we're willing to pay fees at open access journals that charge fees, are we willing to pay at hybrid journals? If we are, we're not solving the problem for library budgets because libraries still have to pay subscriptions. Uh, at Harvard, we refuse to pay fees at hybrid journals. We do pay fees at full open access journals that charge fees, and we do it to help our authors provide open access to their research. But we want to spend our money in a way that creates good incentives for the evolution of the system. And we think supporting hybrid journals that continue to charge subscription fees is a bad idea. It creates bad incentives for journals. Well, suppose that idea took off and more, journal, more universities followed our uh, rule about that. Then we wouldn't pay the fees at hybrid journals. And how do we move close to something like the Max Planck model? Or how do we move close to something like universal uh, open access? The alternative is a mass simultaneous flip, which is not going to happen. So it pinches us from another direction. So another way to put this as a question, how do we support fee-based open access journals uh, when some of them, actually most of them, continue to charge subscriptions to libraries? If one goal is to uh, free up library budgets and not simply to make research open, uh, how do we do that? Another problem with the uh, Max Planck model is that it seriously asks all libraries to cooperate in redirecting their subscription money to support APCs. But it doesn't even ask how that could be done. Uh, how could your library do that? tomorrow? Could you realistically flip all of your subscription money to support APCs? I don't think any library finds that easy to do, let alone to do in coordination with every other library in the world. Apart from the lack of realism here, there is the antitrust problem. Even if we wanted to, could we do this in coordination with all the universities in the world? There are legal obstacles, uh, not to mention collective action obstacles. How do we overcome those? Again, we can't overcome them. So how do we get there from here? Mackenzie asked the question, uh, the right question, the good question. How do we uh, create competition at the APC level for authors? Uh, if we could do that, then fees would be driven down by market forces, and we wouldn't have to uh, pay as much as we would have had to pay otherwise. In fact, we might pay so little that suddenly it would be affordable, uh, even without uh, funding agency contributions. At Harvard, we take a couple steps in that direction, but they're not enough, but I'll just mention what they are. When we pay APCs to journals on behalf of our faculty, we put a cap on them, and we say we will give uh, $3,000 per faculty member per year, and that's it. 
Moreover, if your funding agency is willing to pay, we will pay nothing whatsoever. Uh, moreover, if you have uh, five co-authors and there are six of you total, we'll pay one-sixth of the fee. And you've got to get your co-authors to ante up. Uh, and if you've reached your cap for the year, uh, then either you pay out of pocket or you don't publish in a fee-based open access journal that year. We don't know if these are changing behavior, but we also know that we couldn't afford not to apply rules like this. Uh, finally, let me just point out, uh, or underline, one conclusion uh, that McKenzie drew. Universities that are high output, like ours, could not afford to pay APCs for all the articles published by all of its faculty if we didn't get supplementary funding from funding agencies. But if we did get that supplementary funding, then we could afford it, and there'd be no problem. So the conclusion should not be the pessimistic one, that uh, we couldn't afford to pay for open access for all of our output. The conclusion is that we couldn't do it alone. And today, uh, according to the last study I saw, roughly 60% of APCs are paid by funding agencies. That's a huge amount. That subsidy is not going to go away because funding agencies see their own reasons to pay these APCs. So whenever we model the future, we should model funding agency contributions together with university contributions. And uh, under McKenzie's study, that turns out to be affordable even for the highest output universities. That's promising. That's optimistic. We just have to solve the other problems about creating author incentives. So with that, maybe I should turn it over to everybody else for questions. And I will just respond, which is that, you know, the points you raised are all great. Um, one of the things I did want to get through is that we uh, need to be talking to authors and their proxies a lot more than we have been in this discussion, right? So finding those societies, engaging with them instead of just talking to ourselves would be a great next step. Hi, um, my name is John McCall. I'm uh, from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, I'm gonna use my position as I think the only non-North American <laughs> attendee at this event to just make a couple of general comments if I may, which, which relate um, to the presentation, Mackenzie. Um, I know quite a few of you, um, and I've met a few of you here, I've enjoyed, very much enjoyed being here. I'm disappointed that I'm the only person from the UK to be here. Uh, we don't have many symposia in the UK, I think we should have more. Um, and we don't have many people like Dan Hazen, whom I never met, sadly. I would love to have met the person who wrote about our profession, uh, that it is a vocation of broad cultural consequence. Uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't meet him, and I never met Ross Atkinson. But um, these two people, nonetheless, have impinged on my consciousness and some of my colleagues in the UK. So I'm, I'm sorry that in response to Sarah's invitation, uh, which was made to RLUK, uh, I'm the only one who <laughs> responded. I am currently the chair of RLUK, which is the president, really, for the next few months. Um, I wanted really to go to the issue of radical scatter that we raised yesterday. Um, uh, and, and I should say, I very much enjoyed the presentation. And, and what I would say, uh, Mackenzie, is that the UK is not nearly as gold as we were. Um, we've kind of moved away from Finch uh, quite a lot. And we're moving towards the next ref, which is making us more green. Um, and so the libraries are taking a bit more control there. I think one of the issues uh, for us is that um, in the UK, what's happening in open access has been driven not really by libraries at all. Um, not since the early days of open access have the libraries really featured. Um, the, the driver is now the funding councils um, and the research councils. Um, and I'm interested that you think that perhaps the answer to the problem that you outlined is, is it for the disciplines uh, to take responsibility. And again, the libraries uh, don't really seem to have any power. Um, with radical scatter, I, I sadly wasn't at John Wilkins' presentation at JISC CNI that was mentioned yesterday. I wish I, wish I had been. Um, but I do think we suffer from radical scatter. I do think it is a problem. I do think we need to find ways to integrate more internationally and to take cooperative collective action as a library community. I think the library community needs to find its voice. Um, and I do think in the US you've done a lot in terms of elements of uh, collaborative infrastructure that the rest of the world should leverage more. Um, I mean, we all know about WorldCat and we all tend to use it. Um, but Hattie, wh why does the UK not use Hattie? Uh, I should be able to answer that question, and I can't, um, and I think it's a great shame. I think we've got other issues like e-journal preservation, where international solutions are needed. I don't think we can solve all our problems with international cooperation. I think this is an issue of scalarity that OCLC has talked about. But I think we need a forum where we can discuss those issues that can be tackled internationally. 
Um, and so I just wanted quickly to mention um, something that many of you probably haven't heard about yet, but um, uh, you know, it'd be nice if you did or if you could at some point. Um, at the RL UK conference last year, we invited um, the, the five, five uh, research library associations from across the world to join us for um, a day and a half of discussion and talk. So we sent an invitation to Larry Afford at ARL, to Martha Whitehead at Carl, to um, Margie Janti at Call in Australia, and to Christina, I've forgotten her surname, it's Finnish, um, from Lieber. So we had five um, research library associations. We had a very productive couple of days, and the outcome of that was a new organization that is now called IARLA. Lorcan Dempsey tells me IARLA is a boy's name in Irish. We didn't know that, um, but IARLA stands for International Alliance of Research Library Associations. It's only been in existence for a few months. We've had a few meetings. We're talking about what we might do internationally as a research library grouping. We're talking about library voice internationally. We're talking about clout. We're talking about possibly down the line governance. Um, but certainly at the moment, it's just a, a forum. Um, we've, and so far, the participants have been the executive directors, um, sometimes the deputy, uh, sorry, executive directors and presidents, sometimes deputy presidents. Um, we have terms of reference. Uh, we're looking at openness. We're looking at trusted research environments, at identifying priorities for international research library attention via member governance structures, commissioning evidence-based research, brokering international partnerships to find at scale uh, international solutions. We're very lightweight at the moment. We have no staff. Um, we're relying on a bit of effort from the ex executive teams, particularly of RL UK and ARL. I think we need a bit more substance, but I just wanted to say for all of you, um, and I know many of you will be in ARL or Carl institutions, IARLA does exist. It's something you might want to think about when we start to think about where we might begin to find a forum to discuss some of these issues. So thank you. I think we're, we're at time, so we should probably, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.